All right, let's get started. Thank you all for joining me today for Trees for Wildlife presentation. And I really want this to be a wonderful Arbor Day celebration, which is today, April 29th. So again, thank you for joining me. Let's get into it. So overall, I want to introduce myself first. My name is Marissa Jacobs and I run a little um, business called The Art of Ecology. And what I do is uh, blend the arts and environmental sciences in numerous ways. So I'll do that through public programs like botanical illustration, or we'll explore the culinary arts as we do foraging, things like that. I also do these virtual presentations and all of the photography that you see throughout this presentation is done by me. So that's kind of a way to incorporate some sort of artistic element, a visual element, and hopefully by the end, you'll be inspired to go out and document the natural world as you see it. I also, since I am doing a lot of art, whether it's through photography, I also do illustration. I also have a lot of art sales stickers, coloring books, um, all sorts of cool merch, and a portion of the proceeds always from any art piece any art sale stickers, you know, five bucks here, whatever, or even from presentations like this one, anything with the Art of Ecology, a portion of the proceeds is always donated back to wildlife conservation efforts and habitat preservation. So thank you for joining. You're not only supporting me as small business, but you're also supporting the wonderful world that we live on. So thank you for that. Just in case you're interested, I do also have here listed some upcoming programs. And if you're watching this virtually, these are all virtual as well. So you don't have to worry about not being local to Bucks County, Pennsylvania, or being able to make it on a certain date or time. For the most part, these will be recorded. Uh, my Trails to Tasting program starting in July is pre-recorded. So you'll be good to go there. All right, so in an overview here, I am showcasing tips for identifying local tree species. So again, we're going over the role that trees play specifically for wildlife. So while we will talk about their ecosystem function and purposes, we're really going to hone in on their wildlife uses. And at the very end, we'll go over some native trees to plant if you're trying to think about how to incorporate new trees into your yards or communities. I'll give a list of some native ones here specifically for southeastern Pennsylvania, but an easy Google search will show many native plants in your area. All right, so let's get into it. We are identifying tree species. And while this may not seem necessarily important for thinking about, oh, I want to add native wildlife plants to my yard and trees are one of the things I want to add. Identifying trees is actually really important to be able to figure out where are you starting from? What trees do you already have in your yards or in your communities? And by taking that sort of inventory, you are then able to say, all right, this is what I need to incorporate. This is what I'm still missing. Um, how might these individual trees provide specific uses for wildlife? And it kind of provides this base platform for you to then jump off of. There are four kind of basic things. One of them is a little more challenging for me personally. Um, however, it's still very important for identifying trees. And we, I have them listed here, but you can, we'll go into a little more depth later as well. But the four basic things to look at are leaves. Leaves are really, really helpful. However, you're only going to be able to use them when there are leaves out. So the next best thing is to look at the bark. Bark is gonna be on the tree year round. 
So if you're looking at a tree in winter or fall, when the leaves have already dropped or in the spring, when um, the buds aren't quite formed yet of new leaves, bark is going to be very helpful in looking at the twig, not just the trunk. You can also take a look and see what flowers does the tree have. And now this is only gonna be really in spring to early summer. So very, very seasonal. However, every tree produces seeds in some capacity. And in order to produce seeds, it needs to have flowers that are pollinated. In some trees, this is very, very obvious. You see big, big flowers. And we think of those as our ornamental trees that we think of the flowering dogwood or a sweet crab apple or the invasive calorie pear. We have lots of trees that are very beautiful, a red bud. But there are other trees like a maple or an oak or a birch. All of these trees have flowers. They just might be really tiny. But looking at these flowers will help you in a field guide to be able to identify what you're looking at in the spring. And then the fourth thing, and this is the one that I find a little more challenging, but still incredibly helpful, is to look at the overall shape. Take a step back so that you can see the tree as a whole and really examine how spready do the limbs get? How tall is it? Is it a, a conical shape? Like a stereotypical, if we think of a kid's drawing of a Christmas tree, right? It's a big triangle versus a lollipop, you know, the trunk within the little lollipop branches coming out. These shapes will be very characteristic of individual trees. For example, a white oak is usually extremely spready and has really tall growth with nice, big, thick, spready branches compared to a pin oak, which is very tall and it has very spindly branches that pop out at very odd angles in more of that... Um, circular but a little bit taller so I guess more uh, cylindrical shaped and they're both oak species but by looking at overall shape you can kind of differentiate between them. This is also helpful if you have a field guide and you're looking at oh trees of North America. Oftentimes in field guides they'll have a little silhouette uh, like a blacked out silhouette of the tree to give you that overall shape or structure of the tree if you're looking at it from afar. So it can be very helpful, but that one does take a little more practice. I'll go into a little more depth about leaves and bark because those are the things that most people are going to be using to identify trees. So I just wanna kind of shout out little anatomical features or specific things to look at on each of them. First is, is the leaf simple or is it compound? A simple leaf is a single, just one leaf attached to a petiole. So if you see here in this maple image, you have your branch and then you have another twig that comes off here. And then add a, a node, which is where a petiole attaches to a twig or a stem or a branch. We have one long, usually very flexible. It's almost like a mini stem that attaches to the leaf itself, that fleshy part. And this kind of flexible mini stem is called the petiole. So there will be one leaf attached to a petiole. This includes, like you can see here with the maple, it includes maples, things like oaks, tulip poplars, anything with one leaf on one petiole. Whereas compound leaves, you can see here in this staghorn sumac picture, you can see that there is the petiole here that connects. It's a little challenging to see because there's just a lot going on here in a sumac, but you have one petiole and then tons of little tiny leaflets coming off 
of that one petiole. So in this, you have leaflets that comprise one leaf on a, on a tree. So you can think of black walnuts, ash, sumacs, like pictured here. There are lots of compound leaves. You can also look at leaf arrangement. And again, in your field guide, you're going to see this terminology. So that's why I'm not going into every single tree species and identifying this because that's what field guides are great for. I'm just kind of giving a basis understanding of what terminology is being used. Leaf arrangement is a really big one. You can have opposite, which is where you can see it very easily in this maple here, where you have a branch and at that node, there are two, one on either side immediately. Think like a plus sign versus alternate, which is more like a Y, where you have, and not a very well-drawn Y, you have one main branch and then you have a twig or a leaf that comes off down at the bottom left, it goes up a little ways, comes off of the off of the right, and it will alternate its arrangement up the branch. You can also have, which is a little less common, but still you might see it, a world pattern, which if you look almost like bird's eye view looking down, or if it's a tree and you can go to the base of the tree and look straight up, you might see, or, or a twig, looking at a twig um, straight up or straight down, you'll see it's almost a spiral pattern going around the twig. There's a mnemonic device that's really helpful for remembering opposite leaf arrangement because there are kind of few trees that have this. Most of them that we would see here in Pennsylvania are going to be alternately arranged. So remembering mad horse will help you as you're going out and you see a tree and you're like, wait, this is opposite arrangement. You know it either has to be a maple, an ash, a dogwood, so M-A-D, or a horse chestnut. Those will be the oppositely arranged trees here in Pennsylvania. You can also look at the size, the shape, the color, the overall appearance of the leaf. You can look at the width or general size of the leaf. What do the margins look like or the leaf edges? Are they complete, meaning that they are very smooth. It is just a leaf. There's no funky edges like a serrated or a toothed edge, which you would think of like a serrated knife for cutting has all those tiny little teeth, or a very lobed leaf like an oak leaf when we think of all the little lobes that come off of it. You also want to think of the color. Is it bright? Is it dull? Is the top really glossy and very shiny looking? It, look at the underside of the leaf. Is it paler on the underside than it is on the top? Sometimes if it's like a whitish color or a dull gray color on the bottom, it's referred to as being glaucous. And this is commonly seen in silver maples, where the top of the leaf is your standard leafy green, and the underside is a glaucous color. And when you're driving down a road and it's about to rain, it hasn't started raining yet, there's changes in atmospheric pressure and just humidity, what's going on in the air. And the maples, the silver maples themselves, will kind of flip their leaves to show their bottom. So you can see as you drive down a road and there's all these maple branches blowing in the wind and they look silvery or white, kind of hence the name of a silver maple, you know it's about to rain. But that will help you to identify, oh, that's a silver maple. Or wow, this is really fat leaf and it's the size of my head. And it looks like a maple leaf, but I don't know what type of maple but it's ginormous. You might know that it's a sugar maple or a Norway maple as compared to something a little bit smaller. Maybe it's only the size of your palm, hand at largest, and maybe it has a red petiole instead of a green one. That might be a red maple. 
So looking at appearance, the arrangement, is it simple, is it compound, will all help you be able to identify the tree that you have. Only if the leaves are present though. In the winter or in the fall, once the leaves have dropped, looking at the bark and the twigs can be the next best thing. You can look to see the texture of it. Is there a lot of really deep furrows or ridges? Are there um, a lot of ash trees are known to have what's called ski slopes, where it looks like if you look at a picture of a ski trail mountain, you see all those wavy lines coming down. That's kind of what the bark of those trees look like. Or it could be super, super smooth, no ridges at all, like an American beech tree, which is highly easily identifiable by its very smooth bark. You can look also at pores, which are called lenticels. And the, every tree has lenticels, just like our skin, the tree's skin is their bark. And like our skin, we have pores in our skin. It's natural. And that helps with gas exchange, waste removal, things like that. Same in the tree. These lenticels will help with gas exchange. In some trees, they are so huge and you can see the individual holes. Here in this cherry tree, you can see it has this dark bark and then suddenly there are these almost um, uh, much larger, like embossed, it almost looks like lines, horizontal lines that are a reddish or a silver in color. And those are the individual pores. Cherry trees are so well known for these very pronounced lenticels. Apple trees or anything in the prunus or malus family, will have very silvery pores compared to their reddish or gray smooth bark. So you can see them really well. In others like an oak tree, they're still there, but they're way more microscopic. You can also look and see, is the bark peeling or exfoliating? meaning it's being removed, but not due to a weird disease or a pathogen that's causing problems. It's just natural. Trees like this, you see here, I have listed cedars will have very strippy red bark. River birches, they're one of my favorite trees ever, and their exfoliating bark is so peely and you can see many layers of color in there. Sycamores, if you think after a storm event, you have these huge plates of bark that fall off of sycamores, and that's completely natural. Others, like a black cherry, may not necessarily be exfoliating, meaning that you can easily just rip it right off, but it's like chunky, blocky bits. Black cherries, I like to identify by their bark very easily because it looks like burnt cornflakes that someone just hot glued onto a tree. So the edges of these cornflake bits of bark kind of are puckered up off of the tree, but that middle portion, it's really stuck to the tree. So it's not something that you can rip off and it's not supposed to fall off like a sycamore or peel off like a birch, but you'll notice it doesn't sit fully flat on the tree. And you can also look at something called a leaf scar. And in the fall, when a tree goes through natural leaf drop, or if a tree is diseased and it's unnatural leaf drop, it's dropping its leaves because it's stressed and unhealthy, the leaf petiole will leave behind a scar. And we think of scars as like, ah, these bad things, but this is completely natural. It happens all the time to trees but you'll actually be able to use the leaf scar shape as a tool to identify the tree by its twig. For example, some petioles connect to the, to the main twig in a very like crescent or U shape, and you'll see little tiny dots within that U shape that are where the vascular tissues actually connected the leaf to the twig. 
Others have a much more circular leaf scar. You can see here, this is a golden curly willow and the leaf scar is right here, kind of near my fingers. You can see the lenticels on the twig are the other little dots, but this right here is one of the leaf scars. You can see it's very circular with a little bit of pucker beneath where the leaf would sit. So using these tools can also help identify the tree. So once you can identify and you go through your yard, you go through your community saying, all right, I know what trees I have. Start to think about, all right, if I'm trying to incorporate more trees into my community or into my, my landscape here, what benefits do I want? Do I want beauty? That's a thing that, that's one of the reasons why we have ornamental trees is because they provide such wonderful beauty to our landscape. But maybe you want it to grow to be really tall and be a wonderful shade tree to reduce the heating costs during the summer. Or maybe you want a windbreak or a privacy barrier. There's so many reasons for us to be planting trees. Today though, I really want to focus on how we can be creating wildlife sanctuaries and habitats and be kind of reestablishing habitat that has been developed over or removed in one way or another for the wildlife to be inviting them kind of back to our ecosystems. First, Trees are going to be great sources of food and nectar, so energy for wildlife species. If we think about all those flowers that I mentioned, even if they're super tiny flowers and they're not big giant flowers like a tulip poplar or a dogwood, butterflies, bees, they will still use those flowers as nectar resources. In the tree itself, you have the sap, which think of a, a good way to relate as humans trying to relate ourselves to a plant or a tree, we can think of sap as our blood, carrying nutrients to and from various parts of our body. There are many birds and other animals who love the sap of trees. It's very nutritious. The leaves and the bark are wonderful brows. You have woody brows or green brows for your herbivore species. And you have the fruits, the seeds, the nuts that are produced in the fall or late summer once the flowers have been pollinated and the seeds germinate. You've got wonderful, wonderful food for many herbivores and omnivores as well. Trees also provide shelter and homes. If we think of how much rain or how much wind we've been having right now, it is so windy. Things need protection from weather, just like we have roofs over our heads, but the trees will kind of help to act as those roofs, that protection for wildlife species. You may also notice that's, you know, tree is a whole big picture, but if you look real up close at under all the ridges and the crevices in the bark, or if you look at a smooth barked tree like a beech tree, and you look at the junctions of the bark to the trunk or the tree, uh, the limbs to the trunk, you might see in those tiny little nooks and crannies, lots and lots of insect life is taking advantage of those small little spaces to nestle in to be protected from the elements as well as from predators. Similarly to shelter and homes, many animals require very specific trees as their nesting site. And I like to break these two out as different things, even though yes, a bird might find a home in a nest or a squirrel will live in a nest. The place to raise their young and specifically have their babies or lay their eggs might not always be the same as where they find shelter. Nesting sites, especially for pollinators such as butterflies, skippers, and moths, need very, very specific requirements, nutritional requirements, to be able to go through their life cycle of metamorphosis. So where they lay, where an adult butterfly would lay its egg, 
is very, very specific. So when the caterpillar hatches out of that egg, it has a host plant or something to chew on immediately that provides it with the nutrients it needs to then go through its larval stage, the pupal stage, and then become an adult. And finally, one of the other main primary benefits that I see, and granted there's, there's so many benefits, but is the ability that trees have to sequester pollution, prevent erosion, and also sequester atmospheric carbon dioxide. So trees are a great way to mitigate climate change, to reduce pollution entering our waterways. And here in Pennsylvania, our number one pollution in water specifically is sediment. So the amount of erosion that happens is really, really damaging to our waterways and trees can help to prevent that sediment from entering those water sources. That may seem like a general ecosystem sort of benefit. However, there are many, many animal species that live in those waterways that are killed when too much erosion comes in, or they can't survive in polluted uh, toxic chemical waterways. We have lots of macroinvertebrates that can actually be used as bioindicators of stream health. And if you have this much biodiversity in your stream, you have kind of okay water quality. If you have this much biodiversity, you have great water quality. And if all you have are snails, you have a lot of problems with your water. And trees can help to pull those toxins out and store it in their um, in their tissue. Now I'll go into a little more depth on each one of those and kind of give some examples along the way. So I know there's a lot more text on these slides, so feel free to read through it as I talk about it. Um, you can always go back to the recording of this later, press pause and like write down notes or take a deeper look at it. However, when we go through, I'm just going to kind of list because again, this is not comprehensive in the slightest. This is just an example of ways that animals will use trees as food or as nesting sites and so forth. For food resources that we want to think about flowers, think about not just the ornamentals, um, which we've got wonderful ornamentals in our magnolias, sweet crab apples are also wonderful. And as I list a lot of these trees and a lot of these plants, I will be listing native species here to Pennsylvania or species that are going to be really, really high quality wildlife habitat here. And for the nectar, going back to nectar, not just for the pollinators, you think of like your butterflies, right? But many of these trees also act as host plants or nesting sites, which we'll get into on a future slide. You have animals that eat the leaves, twigs, bark, the woody portion or that green portion. You've got caterpillars who are using the plant as a host plant who are going to be munching on the leaves as well as many herbivores, deer, rabbits, things like that. And then you have the young wood. Think of all those little twigs and a lot of times we're like, no, we don't want the deer to come and munch down our twigs. However, we all are part of this ecosystem together. We need to be providing them with the food resources, otherwise populations will decline. And they are important members of our ecosystems. So we want to be able to provide some food for them so they're not having to um, change their range or outcompete other species who also live here. We want to also be providing them with sap. Think of in this picture here on the right, we have a yellow-bellied sap sucker who is the one responsible for making these rows of tiny itty bitty little holes that we may see in a lot of our trees and not know who is making those holes. It's this guy, the one of the reasons why I was able to see that there was a bird here was because I saw its profile. I was able to see that shape of the bird off of the tree. 
as compared to if this bird was flush with the tree, there you can kind of see the modeling on their back. They are so highly camouflaged that they are really hard to see when they're just flush with the tree. So that might be a reason why we don't always see who is making those holes. But this little, this little guy is responsible for that. They'll peck holes that are shallow so that it's not super harmful to the tree. It's more like a little paper cut, not very deep at all, but it causes sap flow and it'll lick all that sap out. It's very nutritious. But then other animals such as a nuthatch, woodpeckers, or nocturnally a bat might come and also take advantage of the highly nutritious sap. And then of course, as I mentioned before, you've got the fruits, the seeds, the nuts. You can think of in um, late summer to early fall, you have the droops, those red berry looking things that are produced on dogwood trees. You have wonderful crab apples in the fall, juniper berries or eastern red cedar berries. Black walnuts are used by many mammals. Uh, squirrels especially love them. Sumac fruits, here you can see this white-throated sparrow is really going to town and enjoying that staghorn sumac even well into the winter. So these, these fruits, these nuts, these seeds can provide really great year-round or even late season food for wildlife. Then we've got shelter. Obviously, we usually think about shelter as being the tree branches or the canopies themselves. Makes a lot of sense, yeah. But we also have, like I said, all those little fissures and cracks and crevices that many insects will take shelter in. One specific insect that will not only use the cracks and the crevices of the bark, but also the lichen that grows on the trees is the lacewing fly. They will use bits of little lichen, they'll rip it off and attach it to their back. And then they'll climb about the tree doing their little lacewing business. They are wonderful um, biological pest control. So having lacewings around is not bad. But if a predator comes, they can just stop. And because that lichen is on their back covering them, they are completely indistinguishable and a bird will just move on. So they live to fight another day. We also want to recognize, and this is something I really, really want to get across, is how important holes in trees and dead trees are to our ecosystems. And we'll, we'll go into a little bit of depth with that. But cavities or holes in trees, whether it's in a live tree or a dead tree, provides habitat for 35-ish bird species, including many that we love, such as the chickadees, bluebirds, screech owls, um, even wood ducks. So we've got waterfowl that will be living in a hole in a tree. But if birds aren't your thing and you're more into the fuzzy cute mammals, we've got raccoons, we've got porcupines. These are animals that might not have the ability to create holes on their own. Think of like woodpeckers will do the drilling and they'll make these big holes. A chickadee is not going to drill holes in a tree, but it needs that habitat. So it'll kind of move in into a hole or if there's been a limb in a tree that's fallen from storm damage and now there's kind of a, a gaping hole where that limb was, they'll use that and move in. Doesn't have to be a dead tree, can be an alive tree. However, dead trees do provide very specific habitat. There are over, just over 40 species of birds plus a, a handful of mammal species that absolutely require something called a snag. And that is a dead tree that is still standing. It hasn't fallen over yet. If we think of our adorable birds of prey, we've got our kestrels who require that habitat. Nut hatches, they're not birds of prey, but now moving on, we've got nut hatches, we've got possums that also require that dead tree cavity to live in. Downed trees, the, now these snags that have fallen over or um, limbs that have fallen from storm events and are now dead 
are going to be providing natural cover for many amphibians. If you ever have rolled over a log before, a rotting log before and looked underneath, you've got all sorts of wonderful decomposers who are now going to town, as well as many worms. We've got snails, isopods, beetles, ants, salamanders, maybe a toad hanging out down there. So this is really, really quality habitat. If you're like, oh, I don't want just random branches, a great thing to do as a homeowner is to have all these branches that have now fallen and start creating a brush pile. These are going to be pieces of habitat. If we think of in the forest, nobody's cleaning up all these sticks and leaves and debris. They're just building naturally, which is great. It's providing homes, chipmunks, fox, sparrows, garter snakes. Um, and if you're like, oh no, snakes, they're going to be mitigating pest populations for you. So we need these predators around. I, my husband is an arborist, so I understand the perspective of saying this, you know, if it's on your property and it's not just a random dead tree in a woodlot, it's on your property and you might be concerned about what's going to happen if this tree falls on my house, if it falls on my garage, the power lines, if my children are out playing, and limbs start falling on them. I get it, we're concerned for our safety. This can be very damaging, very cost prohibitive to keep dead trees around just because we want a possum to hang out. So I, I get that. One thing to do is to say, okay, I see that I have this giant tall dead tree, which you can see in this picture here. Granted, this was taken in a forest setting, so there's no buildings around to be damaged at all. But what you can do as a homeowner, if this is on your property and it is in close proximity to buildings, to garages, to sheds, what have you, one thing you can do is have someone chunk it down to be a much more manageable size, maybe 15 to 20 feet tall, 10 to 20 feet tall, depending on the proximity to other buildings or to like play areas, things like that, chunk it down in size and then have the arborist or someone to help you out and kind of chop holes into the top of it, make it uneven, don't just cut flat across and kind of create what looks like a normal standard dead tree, but now it's much, much shorter. It still is providing that habitat for these species that require these dead snags but you don't have to worry about if it falls over. When you remove the top part, this lightweight part of the tree, you don't have to worry as much about storm damage. Those dead limbs aren't gonna be falling, they're gone. A lot of the weight of the tree has been removed, so it's not gonna be catching in the wind like a sail. And as natural decomposition, as the rain comes, breaks things down, natural insects, woodpeckers come and have their way with the tree, you'll notice that it kind of just almost looks like it's melting in on itself as compared to just falling over. So you don't have the same worries or dangers that you would while you still are able then to keep that quality habitat. Then we have nesting sites. And here I have a list of six wonderful, wonderful trees to have specifically for our butterflies and pollinators and birds as well, who are going to be using trees as nesting locations to be raising their young. In each list, it starts with the, the butterflies are moths or skippers. And then you have some birds, if a bird will rely specifically on that tree. For tulip poplars, these are giant, giant trees with vibrant yellow and orange, huge flowers, but these are really, really tall trees. So we don't often see the flowers unless we're like on a hill looking down at them or a flower falls off of the tree in a storm event. But many, many butterflies will appreciate that nectar source. They also have very nice wide fat leaves. These are leaves that kind of look like cat faces. They have like whisker points here and then two cat ears at the top. Uh, and they're huge. They're the size of my face. And this broad leaf can provide a lot of food resource as well as really great shelter and shade. 
So we'll have butterflies like a tiger swallowtail who rely on tulip poplars to lay their eggs on. Oaks are one of the absolute best trees. If you have the space or you are doing a tree planting on a wooded preserve or doing forest restoration, oaks are some of the best trees to plant as they support a wide, wide range of biodiversity. So you've got here, I, I made mention of a uh, hair streak. You've got early hair streaks, banded hair streaks. They're going to be enjoying an oak. Those are like little moth skipper butterfly category insects. And then you have even things like bald eagles who because an oak tree is able to be so tall and so sturdy and strong, oak wood is very, very strong. It can support that three to four foot diameter nest that an eagle is going to be making. You've got smaller birds like your chickadees or your wood warblers who are also going to be taking advantage. So if you're saying, well, I have a lot of space to plant a nice big oak, oaks are the way to go. If you have smaller space though, the birch, spice bush, dogwood, willow, they'll all stay kind of smaller and a little more compact while also supporting valuable pollinators. In fact, dogwood trees are the specific host plant for spring azures. So if you like those little tiny blue butterfly skippers, that's where they're coming from. And then, as I mentioned before, we've got the whole ability to be cleaning our waterways and our air. So they are, trees are huge, huge resource to be mitigating and battling human-caused climate change. Now, not every tree is as good at it as others. So some of the best trees for sequestering carbon dioxide in their wood tissue are going to be your tulip poplars, sweet gums, and pines are really, really quality. So if that is one of your goals, you're saying, I want to plant a tree because I want to reduce and mitigate climate change. Any of those in that category are going to be really, really quality uh, carbon dioxide sinkholes, more or less, in our region. Now, as I, as I mentioned, I'm talking a lot about native trees or ones that are going to be providing really good quality habitat for our wildlife species here. And it's not that I necessarily have anything absolutely against an ornamental tree, but if you are trying to get the best bang for your buck here, your trees can be pretty expensive, especially if you're getting more established ones as compared to little saplings or seedlings. If you want the most bang for your buck, planting a native tree is going to be the best choice. Not only is that tree specially adapted to your region, it understands soil conditions. It understands that, wow, here in Pennsylvania, we have weird weird springs that are rainy and then they're not rainy and suddenly they get really hot and then suddenly it snows and gets rainy again. And that we have nice summers and then suddenly in summer we've got drought for two months, July and August, right? These plants have adapted to that. They're used to it. So your maintenance and your watering and your fertilizing costs, that's all going to go downhill really decrease because the tree understands the climate it belongs to. It's also going to have adapted alongside the wildlife and be able to provide the best nutrients for the wildlife species that are living alongside it. So this is, you know, I can't rant and rave about native plants enough, but if you're ever considering, hmm, should I do a native plant or should I do an ornamental? Always go native if you can. Now, moral of the story though, is not every native plant is going to be as good in every single place, right? So putting a river birch, you know, the name itself kind of should hint where it likes to be, rivers. 
They like water. Putting it in a really sunny spot where it's nice and dry and you have your little rock garden, your river birch is not going to be happy. That's the right plant. It's native, but it's not the right place. So that's kind of a saying that's in the arboriculture, silviculture, horticulture industries of you need to put the right plant in the right place. So some things to consider as you're looking at your property or you're looking at an organization's property like a nature center or a woodlot that you're trying to do a restoration project at, you need to think about all of the other factors that are going to play a part in where you should be planting. Think about the proximity to buildings. Is this tree gonna get really, really tall like a giant white oak and oh, you're trying to make that a street tree? That's not gonna go well. It's gonna get huge, take over the power lines, fall onto roofs. It's so close to other buildings. And then ultimately it's gonna get to be the size it wants to be, it's supposed to be. And people, municipalities, homeowners are gonna say, whoa, no, 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 no. I can't do that. And they're gonna cut it down. Well, that didn't help anybody, right? So you wanna think about how close to buildings, to power lines, driveways, parking lots, you want your trees. Maybe you do want it really close because you want that shade buffer or that wind buffer, that insulation. These are all things to consider. And then to say, okay, maybe I don't put a white oak right up against my house, but a Japanese maple, while not native, it's a great ornamental. Or if you have, you're looking for natives and you want an Eastern redbud right next to your house to kind of provide a little bit of shade, a little bit of windbreak, but it's not ever gonna get really big and threaten or be damaging. You also want to think about what is going to happen on the soil. Are you going to be mowing? Are you going to be playing? Are you trying to put, um, install street trees over time you, and thinking about, okay, well, how compacted is the soil going to get? Tree roots need oxygen, they need to breathe. And as we're compacting, we're maybe it's at a playground in a park and you wanna plant a tree there, but you have all the kids running around, compacting the soil, pushing it down. You're decreasing the amount of space that oxygen can kind of get in there and be in the soil. So it's gonna have a negative impact on soil or root health unless a tree is really hardy and can handle that. If you are planting a tree who really likes their roots to be exposed to get that great, great oxygen, but it's in a lawn and you're trying to mow over top, you're gonna to be chopping up those roots or the trunk with a weed whacker or a lawn mower. And that's gonna be creating infection sites where bacteria, where pathogens, fungi can enter just like if we get a cut on our skin and then we don't wash it, right? The bad things happen. So we wanna be very conscientious about what's going on in the area. And like I had mentioned with the river birch, we wanna think about what is the primary water source for this tree? Is this a dry area where I'm gonna to have to be watering the tree all the time? Or is it along a stream or river bank in a riparian zone? Well. You would want to put a tree that can tolerate drought in a dry area and a tree that likes being wet in a wet area. That makes sense, but a lot of times it's not something people think of before they plant. So as the last portion, I've got some great native trees here, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that you want to think about as you think about purchasing a plant. So even before you plant the tree, but before you purchase the tree too, what kind of our mindsets should be? So, you know, you can say, all right, well, I don't want a red maple, but now I know the things I should look for as I choose my tree. Red maples though, uh, Acer rubrum, they love sunny, sunny, bright areas with moderately damp soil. So not not wet, super saturated soil, but nice, evenly moist soil. They can stay relatively small. So in the tree world, 40 feet is kind of small. It's 
on the small to medium size, but they can get really big if they have the space and the sunshine to do so. They can get up to 100 feet tall, which is really tall. In terms of landscape value, because this is definitely something we want to think about of how beautiful is it going to be? Or is it going to be kind of like a eh, sort of tree that it's really only there because we want to feel good about ourselves? We planted a tree, huzzah. No, we want beautiful things too. In the early spring, you can see here, we have a herald. This is a herald of spring. You'll see these are some of the first tree flowers that will be in bloom. And if you look out and you have red maples in your area, you'll see just a blanket of red in the landscape because of how beautiful these flowers are. They tend to be rather small, but they almost look like little fireworks. In the fall, you've got beautiful, beautiful, fiery red fall foliage if you've had the right environmental conditions. Otherwise, it might be more of like a brick red if it's been really cold or really stormy. In terms of wildlife value, you're providing woody browse. I mean, any of these native trees are going to be providing woody browse for herbivores. But red maples are also a great nesting habitat. They're also prone to cavity sites, those holes, in live trees. So not that it's going to cause any death or damage, you just might find little holes around. And they also have wonderful samaras, or you may know them as like the little helicopter seeds that as they fall to the ground, right? Those seeds are really high in good, wonderful, nutritious fats for wildlife populations. Another one that would be an evergreen is an eastern red cedar, which is Juniperus virginiana. They like, just like the maple, they like sunshine, lots of wonderful sun. Uh, they would prefer to have evenly moist soil, not super saturated again. However, if you are concerned, as kind of anyone in southeastern Pennsylvania should be, about drought conditions in late summer, Cedars can be drought tolerant for periods of time, not extended like months and months and months and months, but for a brief portion of a season, they can handle it and they'll be able to come back from any drought damage that does occur. These will stay fairly small for the most part, being only kind of capping out around 45 feet tall, so that's medium-ish range, but they'll be on the smaller side. So a lot of people will use these as privacy borders um, or little tiny stands out in a naturalized meadow for birds. These would be great for that. Landscape value, they're evergreen. So you don't have just boring gray landscape forever. You have some nice green dotted in there, especially with the cones that they produce. They have fleshy cones. So in this picture here, you see the male portions, these yellow portions, and eventually you may be familiar with the tiny blue fleshy, it almost looks like random little blueberries scattered all along the branch. So some great, nice color as well. For wildlife value, those, the food from the cones, from the male reproductive parts, the catkins, the pollen grains, um, bark can really provide valuable habitat for flying squirrels in this area. So we've got lots of wonderful shelter options as well as food. Another evergreen that we often think of is the eastern white pine. These, are one of the reasons why these are so high up on my list is because they're so adaptable and flexible, right? They, I have here varied sun slash dry because if you have a sunny spot, they like it. If you have a shady spot, they like it. If you have a dry spot, they like it. If you have a wet spot, they like it. So really, if you are at a loss for what tree do I put here, a pine might be a really great option. They usually are more on the medium size. However, you can see in this picture here, this one just kept growing, towering above, and they can get a little bit taller. This one is in a forest environment, so that's why it looks a little different from 
a more residential or a cultivated environment that gets even sun. For wildlife, you've got wonderful nesting habitat, uh, the food in the forms of seeds from cones. Um, this is a conifer that the entire thing is edible. The sap is great, the resin, the needles, the bark, the roots, the cones, it's all wonderful and can be used by numerous, numerous mammal species. And finally, as a uh, flowering option, we've got the Eastern red bud, which is Cercis canadensis. These are gonna be, I think I have one that's like right on the other side of the window that I have here. Uh, I think they're, they're still blooming at this point in Arbor Day. They're wonderful spring flowering tree. And you'll see they get these funny little flowers that look as if they're almost like just bursting out of the twig or the bark itself before it gets these cute little heart-shaped, like very heart-shaped leaves in the late spring. You'll plant these in areas that get sun or shade. The, the trees that I see usually growing just wild as compared to ones that are cultivated are usually on edge habitats. So areas of like where a wood lot butts up against a property or a naturalized meadow area. And these little red buds will kind of be under the canopy, but where they can reach out and still get some sun. These are a little more picky with their soil. They do want well-drained soil but that also gets access to water, but they don't want to stay wet. So they're a little more picky, but they are beautiful, beautiful, very rewarding trees to have. They also stay pretty small. They're a little more shrubby. So you might have a red bud on your property that stays in the eight to 12 foot range for a really long time. Uh, they, they do stay pretty small, usually capping out at no more than 30 feet tall. And those are usually the um, more ornamental planted ones that have lots of great space and sunshine. So there's not a lot of competition for resources. So this can be a really nice one if you're looking for trees to put up against your house or up against a driveway to add some nice color because they're gonna stay small and any damage that they cause would be very, very minimal. Because they do have these wonderful flowers, they're going to provide great nectar for early season butterflies and other pollinators such as bumblebees. They will have food in the form of seed pods and think more like, it's almost like a pea pod, but a flat, like dry pea pod with these chunky seeds in them. So the seeds are very substantial. So they provide great, great nutrients. And because I can't not, river birch is, like I said, one of my favorite trees. Uh, I don't, it's pretty tied with the staghorn sumac, but I did want to show what the exfoliating bark and having a tree specifically for the landscape value that the bark adds. This is really beautiful. They'll have this tannish, whitish tan bark on the outside. And as you see the inner layers of bark, you see it's a cinnamon red color. So as it peels and exfoliates naturally, you'll see some really great color changes. This image here on the side is a very young tree. It is roughly five years old. When it was originally planted, it was about half the size. It was about five feet, five to six feet tall. I planted it and it was just above my head. So I'm five, six. So I could reach the top very easily with my hands. And now it is skyrocketed in height. They grow pretty quickly, especially when planted in their preferred area, which is wet, moist areas. As the name suggests, they like wet spots. So this was planted in a rain garden. And if you as a homeowner have a section of your property that just really retains water, it doesn't percolate, stormwater just kind of sits on the surface and it's really mucky and gooky, a river birch is a great tree to plant there if you want to plant a tree there as they'll help to absorb a lot of that excess water and move it into the groundwater table.
the catkins, so that the male portion of the reproductive structures of this tree are really, really attractive to pine siskins, which is a bird that a lot of people here, at least in Bucks County, are very fascinated with. They're not the most common, but they're really cute little guys that you might see in the spring or the fall. The seeds are loved by many, many birds and lots of herbivores like the woody brows. However, they know not to over browse on this tree and to browse just enough that it actually stimulates tree growth. So a, a wonderful uh, maintenance done by nature for you. So just wonderful trees, but I am biased. These are great. <laughs> so now if anyone has any questions, um, I know we, we covered a fair bit, but if you've got questions, feel free to let me know. Okay, uh, if you do think of questions in the future or you're watching this just through the recording. Um, oh, I see Paige in the chat. Oh, thank you. I, I am very enthusiastic about trees. Anytime I can talk about them, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> thank you. Um, anyone else who might be watching the recording? Uh, and has questions, please feel free to reach out via email or uh, comment on the video. My email is mjacobs at theartofecology.com. So feel free to reach out with anything in the future. But otherwise, thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.